All right, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing podcast. Our guest today is Victor Laval. Hey, Victor. Hello. Thanks for coming on the show, man. Good to I'm see you. I'm excited. Yeah, yeah, same here. Ben's, Ben's in the middle of uh, uh, traveling, and he's so excited he's on the side of the roads stopping for this. <laughs> It is a gas station parking lot. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Not quite the side of the road. Horror, horror stories have, have begun this way. I just want you to know. Yeah, so. sure. It's fine. Yeah. yeah when, we sure. see that, uh, that, when we see that passenger window or the driver's side window smash in, we'll know it's <laughs> begun. That's right. Hey, Linda. Linda, oh, I awesome. watching. Hi, Linda. Uh, so anyway, yeah, we we got a sparse crew because this uh, this weekend is the HP Lovecraft Film Festival. Oh, nice! Yes, which uh, I I couldn't go to for various reasons, and I'm I'm missing everybody. Uh, wish I was around the table drinking a beer with them, but next year, and Necronomicon, you know, next year too. So there's all that. So. Um, but we've got Ben and we've got Bridget and me, and most importantly, we got Victor. And um, Victor knows who all of you, you guys are because Victor is actually a, a patron and uh, listens to us every week. So, so yeah, thanks for that. Wow. I do. I enjoy it. I, I, uh, I was telling Mike, uh, you know, what do you call it? The, um, what do they call it when, when it's like a, the repeat performance? You know what I mean? Like uh, while I'm doing dishes in the morning or in the evening after dinner, I just play it in my headphones and enjoy. Yeah, the archive version. Yeah. Yes, archived. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. so yeah, thanks. Um, actually, uh, I appreciate all my patrons. I'm actually getting their permission to to list all of them. But speaking about Victor, right now, Victor, you had a really um, great analogy. I was wondering if you'd share it before we get into interviewing you, why you became a patron, I mean. Oh, well, I was just saying to you that uh, I thought of, uh, like, the the pleasure of this. Obviously, I always enjoy the guests, and uh, I'm happy to be one, honored to be one myself. But the real point of the thing for me, the fun is the hangout with, like, the regulars at the bar you know, and, right. and then uh, this is a chance for me to hang out with the regulars at the bar. Um, but that uh, if I thought about like my local bar um, back when I could do that, uh, and I would, if I was going to be like every Sunday, I'd go hang out with some friends and neighbors in the local bar, I would certainly spend more than I do on the Patreon each month. But it's the same feeling of just that hangout and the idea of patronizing the bar uh, a little bit in order to you know, keep it open so I can come back. Like that was my feeling about the place. Although with that in mind, I am also drinking some whiskey uh, <laughs> to make it feel a little bit like a bar. That's, that's what you should nice. do when you come on the, the, the Easy Podcast. But yeah, thanks for that. Um, that means a lot coming from you. And I get that from a lot of people. And it's the best, really the best compliment I think that I, I get as far as I'm concerned that people feel like, they're just with us, you know, even if they're not a panelist, they're here in a way with us um, hanging out. And, right. you know, so that's, that's, that's what I wanted. You know, guests are important. Um, I'm really going to enjoy talking with you today, Victor. But yeah, that feeling of community is really important to me. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm happy to hear you say that. So, um, you have um, on your your uh, your your um, Twitter page. You wrote um, in the, in your little bios. You've got there is no future in despair. And I wanted to start with that because um, I wanted to ask you why you wrote that, and because I, I love that so much. It reminds me of. I, I know that I'm a nerd and you know, I'm a nerd because you listen to the, the podcast, but, you know, uh, Superman and his, his shield meaning hope. Mm-hmm. And in the, the crisis on infinite earths, um, the best part of that was Brandon Routh playing the, the Christopher Reeve version of Superman and um, a, an alternate universe 
in his universe, um, the Joker killed everyone close to him, including Lois Lane, his wife. And an alternate Lois from another universe uh, asked him, he had, he had black on his crest instead of the yellow in the back. And she goes, hey, why did, why did you add black to it? And he said, because, Lois, even in the darkest times, hope cuts through. Hope is the light that lifts us out of darkness. And so uh, maybe I'm a nerd for bringing up Superman quotes, but I, I just love that so much. And when I saw that on your bio, I, I immediately thought of that. So, um, so yeah, could you start with that? Well, I mean, uh, this is gonna. This is a, 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 I don't know, slightly embarrassing admission, but honestly, like, um, um, I put out a comic book that's just finished up called Eve. That's like a kind of post-apocalyptic uh, climate science fiction novel. I'm very sci-fi. excited to read this. Yeah. Uh, and um, essentially, that's something that I just have Eve say in the last issue, and. Um, it was very moving to me, like after the, the fifth issue came out and I had a number of people uh, actually just write me through my, either DM me on Twitter or email through the website or whatever. And they said like that line in particular stayed with them. And when I'd written it into her voice, cause like the heart of the story, she's an 11 year old black girl who has to save the world from essentially what all of us adults have done to it. Right. Um, and, uh, um, but at heart, I think the Superman, comparison is a good one because one of the only things that she was not allowed to do like in my mind the one thing about her that would always be a constant would be that she didn't despair Uh, and part of that is because she's still only 11 so she's still on the cusp of like when you imagine uh, thinking positively and acting positively can work to change the world uh, and that that's one of the ways you convince older people that it actually can be changed. Right. Um, and two, because uh, I mean, I don't want to do any spoilers, I guess, for the comic for anybody, but uh, because she's been in a situation where she was not in the world. Um, and so every day she's in it for her is a gift. And uh, so all of that, I felt like that line, she says at the end to a, another very important character. And even when I wrote it, I felt like, oh, that is... I think that is the state I'm in right now. Uh, feeling despair, but knowing there's no future in despair. Right. Well, uh, it, I, I'm very excited to read this comic. Um, is it out already and I missed it, or is it coming out in the near future? It came out uh, comic shops only um, the last five months, but the graphic novel will come out March 2022. Okay, and that's so, good to know. It, will it be on uh, sites like? Uh, will it be digital as well? Like on I hope so. I hope so. You know, it's a, that's a, a really good question. I, I mean, so the studio who's publishing it is a independent called Boom Studios. They do a lot of great stuff, and um, uh, I just have to. I would have to check with them. I would like to hope so because I know people were reading the single issues digitally. Yeah. So if they were reading that, I would imagine. Oh, the, the single issues are available digitally? I believe they were. I mean, I saw some people saying that they'd read it like on their whatever device it was, certainly not their so iPad. Normally, well, at least Boom does publish on Comixology. So unless unless you'd specified not, I would think they would have. Right. Thank you. Yeah, no, I de- and I definitely did not specify not. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, for those, uh, we didn't do our usual introductions and I want to say something about Rick Lay. Uh, for those who are not watching and who are listening later if you're watching you can see who's here um but it's ben handelman uh he's been busy we haven't seen him in a while uh bridget brenmark and uh, me and victor lavelle so um so it's the four of us now rick called me earlier today um rick as you probably know victor is a um he's been writing for a very long time he loves pulp pulp fiction uh, Lovecraftian fiction, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, I love the hell out of this guy. I think if everybody like in the world was like Rick, the Rick would, the world would be such a great, better place. Anyway, he called because he's sick and he said, I can't even write an email right now, um, which panicked me. 
And I was like, oh, God, Rick. And he's like, no, no, it's okay. I'm just sick. It's not, I'll be, I'll be all right. I was like, okay, good. But I need you to tell Victor Laval that I really wanted to meet him, you know, in person. And that I think he's one of the greatest horror writers uh, working today. So Wow. That means a lot. That's amazing. Uh, please tell him I said thanks. Well, uh, I, I will. Say thanks, Frank. I'm, sh I'm sure he'll be watching this. If he's not watching live, he'll probably watch later. But but yeah, I value Rick's opinion. That means a lot coming from Rick. And For sure. I mean, we all know you're a great writer, too. But um, That's very kind. That's very yeah. kind. And I appreciate it. Um, so... Um, so we talked we talked about Eve. I'm gonna check that out. I didn't realize that it was out already because I, I really like um, you know and, and just, I, I don't mean to interrupt, Mike. Yeah, I confirmed it is on comicsology. It's up there right oh, now. Nice. Oh, oh thank you. That's great. Thanks. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna grab those then. I didn't know either, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a there's a higher profit margin for them doing digital comics, so you you know right. I should know. Out. So, because they usually charge the same price. Um, Is that right? Most comics do, yeah. Um, so, um, but you know, there's so much that we're doing, not not us personally, but this generation and the previous generation. I mean, in the mid 2030s, we're looking at, at serious flooding on the coasts uh, of America, you know, because of melting ice caps and things like that and you know what do we do about this what do we leave what kind of world are we leaving our kids you know and pretty bad one a and, pretty bad one yeah and is I it mean, too late uh, you know i don't know well it's interesting like the uh i mean i do think so a lot of eve my wife is a writer as well uh and she she writes fiction, but she's also shifted uh, to writing a lot of climate, like nonfiction work. Um, and so, uh, and in particular focused on, so we have two sons, eight and 10. And since they've been born, uh, there's a way that, um, I think it, more, it, it, it localized her concern in a way, um, because a lot of climate uh, conversations uh, are often very big, kind of scale stuff, the, you know, the ice caps are melting, the temperatures are going up one point something degrees, whatever it is, but sometimes that can feel almost so big, it's hard to fathom, you know, right. uh, in scale. And so a lot of her work has been like, uh, it began with uh, an essay that uh, made a lot of rounds, which was basically just like, what is the playground where we take our older son when he was just two, three years old, what will this place look like in a couple of years? And at the time we were living in uh, Washington Heights, which is the highest elevation in Manhattan. And so part of what she's talking about is, well, how much of Manhattan below us will be gone? Um, you know, certainly the lowest part uh, um, down by Wall Street has very little time, relatively speaking on the geological scale, certainly uh, left. Um, and, and when she wrote that the idea of just Manhattan getting eating, eaten up. And then the idea of the, certainly the whole uh, East Coast getting eaten up and uh, <clears throat> started to play in my mind. And then on the West Coast, of course, you have wildfires, quakes, all the rest. Um, and then not to mention uh, another thing that we'll be dealing with, that we are already dealing with is climate refugees, right? Like uh, there's, I think the mistaken idea that even if the United States, <clears throat> let's say the United States and India and China, but let's just talk about the US, even if they changed everything, like right now, the things we've been doing for 50 years have already made life farther down the Americas almost unlivable, right? And so when we see these narratives about these caravans of people who are coming up here, one of the, the narrative is always either, either we let in these asylum seekers or keep those terrible, non-white people out. But there's a third narrative, which is the reason this is happening is because our, um, our uh, ways of living for 50 years or more, 100 years, have made it so that those folks cannot stay in Central America. They cannot, stay. it's not that they don't want to, they cannot right. because of uh, uh, massive climate change. 
And so um, feeling like even that part of the narrative, like in a way that if, if we were more generally, more broadly open to admitting that climate change existed and therefore made policy changes, like there's ways to say, well, if we help those countries work through those effects, then if you don't want people here, that's the way you get, that's one of the ways you do it is you make it so that where they are now is not unlivable, right? Um, right? And that, and to add to that, people say like, well, why is that our problem? Is because we're one of the greatest polluters on earth and it shifts downward. So it all is like tied together. And which is to say all of those things that my wife was reading about, uh, I wanted to write about it, but I knew I could never uh, match her level of like uh, wisdom and research on the nonfiction end. But I figured I could write a comic book. Like that's what I could do. And, you know, and in my way, add to that conversation from the other end. Well, I, I want to read the comic book, but also what, since you brought up your wife's uh, wisdom and her her nonfiction uh, writings on this, where can we find, uh, what what is your wife's name and where? Uh, her name is Emily Roboto. Um, right now, I would say like, so she, she had, she, a number of these essays have been in like New York Magazine, the New Yorker, New York Review of Books, um, uh, Orion Magazine, uh, like uh, if you if you were interested, even in uh, like if you go because the New Yorker has a pretty great um, archive that you can search, and her stuff comes up. The essay that she did there that was one of her first ones that really uh, got her a lot of attention. Comes it, up. It's Emily, but how do you spell her last name, Victor? R A B O T E A U. Okay, Rabato. So yeah, I, I will look those up. But then sure many listening will too it's it's i mean i think it, it's a gripping read and then she had one in new york magazine where she for a year she was doing this twitter thread that was just her culling reports of how climate is is completely changed like upending people's lives almost overnight and they essentially published that thread as it's essentially her narrative of a year of the world changing and it sort of culminates in, if you remember, at the end of last year, all those fires in Australia that were literally sending animals and humans out into the ocean just to escape the burning center. And it felt like, uh, that, yeah, that sums up 2020. Yeah. About right. It does. You know. Well, um, before we get off this, I just want to point out something that, it, you know, before Katrina, there were interviews about the possibility of uh, New Orleans being flooded. And I remember seeing one video um, that was a year or two, a, a news video that was a year or two before Katrina happened. And I saw it a year or two after Katrina happened. And the reporter was like, so you, you're actually saying, and he was almost like, didn't quite believe what the guy was saying. You're actually saying, so the water would be up to here past the signpost and everything. Like, and, the, and the guy, the expert was like, yeah. Yeah, it, it will be, it very possibly could be. And then a year or two later, exactly what he said happens. And I just yeah. think that, unfortunately, the human race is very, very good at uh, locking the barn door after the horses have bolted. Right. And I, well, and I wish we could be a little bit more proactive in, you know, before these things happen. Well, you know, I would also say, I mean, I feel like in the one place where I want to give humanity an ounce of credit and it's not credit exactly, but it is very difficult on a humans for human beings to understand an issue until it affects them personally, right? Yeah. Like, unfortunately, I wish that wasn't the case. I wish we could scale up in that way. But you hear it just the last year, like the number of people who are like, COVID's not real, and then they get COVID, and then they kind of go, ah, it's real, I guess. Right. Uh, and then, and you can use that for, I don't know, whatever, you know, any, any region, any group of people, whatever you want to say, whatever they experience, it's very difficult for people outside of that bubble or place to experience, to, to, to understand it until you say like, oh, you know, well, my sister went through that or my father went through that. Or, and then all of a sudden it kind of opens the gates. But as a result, um, I remember that old Simpsons episode where, um, what was his name? Uh, I think John Waters was on and he plays a, a, a gay character who Homer is very homophobic. 
mm-hmm. at the end of the episode, John Waters saves Homer from something like there's some life, um, his life is at risk and John Waters swoops in and saves him. And, <clears throat> and Homer says, you know what, John, like you're all right. And then he, John says, uh, John Waters says, now if only every gay person on earth would save your life, you'd think that about all of us. And he says, totally right. And you just say like, I mean, the Simpsons were right, right? Like that is- There's a lot of wisdom in the Simpsons. Yes, (laughs) for sure. All right, so moving on to to more of of your work, and if if someone who had not um, gotten around to reading your work yet, and you're you're like, oh yeah, I'm a writer, you know, and they said to you, oh, oh, that's great. What kind of, what kind of, what kind of uh, writing do you do? What, what, What kind of, what, what kind of books do you write? What what would your answer be to them? Actually, you know, I know you write different things. You know, I write different things, but you know, like uh, this past weekend, uh, we were at a a family. I, I, my father in law passed away, and so we were at the funeral uh, for my father in law. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, but um, at the funeral, uh, like afterward, you know, uh, everyone gets together. We're outdoors, but we're all eating. It's the adults here. The grandkids are playing over there. All the rest, like the beautiful part of the funeral, which is family coming back together, friends coming together and showing the the love of this person sort of trickling through all these other people, you know? Uh, so that was nice. But this, um, I, I met this woman there, this older woman who had been an editor in New York for many, many years. And uh, I, she said, so what kind of things do you write? And I said, I write horror books and comics. And it was, you know, and at this point now there's a certain pleasure in just seeing the moment of like, like you know, like the freeze up you know, depending on who I'm talking to. Backing away slowly. Well, it depends though, because the <laughs> other the other joy is that the number of times where I've seen people go, huh, like lean in. And yeah. there's there's a way that like, uh, my first two books are literary, literary fiction, like literary realism uh, based on my own life, pure autobiography. Um, and everything since those two has been, if they want to call it speculative fiction, literary horror i call it horror comic books um i felt so much happier saying it that way and in a way like i get to it kind of it kind of cuts through um like should we keep talking or should we not keep talking about this because we could just talk about other things like right. what's in the news uh what kind of car do you drive i don't know like whatever um uh so that's what i usually say is i write horror novels and comic books and if it interests them, then, you know, you can exactly do, oh, and by the way, I wrote this literary kind of fantasy book and so on and so forth, you know, that, that kind of stuff. It can, I mean, certainly it can go that way if we get deeper into it, but, uh, right. you know, the other nice thing is I also just like to usually ask people also like, well, what do you read? Like, what do you enjoy? You know, and uh, sometimes the answer is I don't read and we talk about other things. And then other times they say, I, I like this or that, you know, and uh, it's, it's just as interesting hearing what other people are into and like why they like those things. Um, I, I'd like to ask you first about uh, The Devil in Silver um, and your, the genesis of that book and why you wrote it and what inspired you to write it. Um, I'm, I'm kicking myself because I'm working my way through everything you've written. So the devil in silver is, is one that I've not gotten to yet. And I was like, I I can't believe I missed this. Um, so I bought it the other day, you know, uh, by the way, I think it's, I I think the devil in silver is the one that's, uh, 499 on Kindle right now, folks. So jump on, jump, jump on that. Um, but can you tell us uh, the, the uh, maybe a spoiler-free premise of that book and, you know, maybe the genesis of that book? Sure. Well, like the, I think the most spoiler-free briefest summary of that book would be it's about a, a, a guy from Queens named Pepper who um, is not mentally ill, nicknamed Pepper, who's not mentally ill, but due to kind of a run-in with some uh, New York police, gets thrown into a mental hospital in Queens um, for a 72 hour hold. Uh, And a 72 hour hold, no matter who you are, you can't fight that. Uh, If they put you in and the hospital accepts you, you're in for 72 hours. And uh, when he gets in there, 
he soon enough to, uh, begins to meet some of the other patients and they tell him that the devil lives on the unit and it's killing them. And of course, at first he thinks, well, they're crazy people. Right. And they exactly. don't know what they're it's talking a about. Beautiful setup. Uh, but then, of course, he discovers uh, something is killing them. And then that's probably all. And then he gets pulled in uh, into their fight. I guess would be the way I'd say it. Uh, this would make a you know we're kind of in a new golden age of television. Yeah. With all the streaming services and everything, and uh, it would make a wonderful you know one-off miniseries. I think. I agree. I mean, certainly, yes, yeah, sure. I, uh, no, I, I think so. Enough on that wood. I know you've got some other things in the works, and yeah, we'll talk about them. But I was just thinking, what a great story that would make on on television. On small right. Screen. Yeah, I'm working on something with this that maybe potentially will go that way. Yeah. Uh, but uh, quite honestly, like I worked on trying to get this made into a show. Goodness, like uh, not eight or nine years ago. Uh, and as is 99% of the time, nothing came of it. Um, and so maybe that will happen again. Um, but it's fun to try. I, I just, in my non-expert opinion, you, you'd be, uh, you'd know better, but it seems like it's not something that you would want to make a, a, into a movie. It would be more of a, of a mini series, you know, like maybe an eight episode mini series or something. I mean, I think it's certainly there's more to it than like uh, maybe you, maybe you'd love to. I mean, personally, <clears throat> personally, like part of the heart of the book, and you talked about like where does it come from was. Uh, um, so I guess I could say like I have a, a good bit of mental illness in my family across multiple generations, and I have spent um, three, four decades visiting family members on mental units. Um, and uh, in my experience, uh, the version of that that I've, that I've lived, I hadn't really seen anywhere because in, in a weird way, uh, it's actually much more mundane than, uh, you know, um, what's that one, Shutter Island or even the, um, uh, One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest. Right. You know, like uh, it's not as, big and loud as that, at least not in the era when I've been going, uh, visiting um, people. Um, and then on the other side, I think um, it's actually much more pernicious than that because uh, I feel like the thing that's often missing from those conversations is the systematic aspect uh, and the idea that um, this is, uh, you know, like the, the narrative is always for places like this, but also for like our prison systems and for our general healthcare system is like, the system's broken kind of thing. But um, the the heart of the devil and silver is to say like, no, it's not actually broken. This is exactly the way it's supposed to work. Um, the people who are in there are people who don't matter to the system. And in fact, the way that they matter is essentially as billable bodies. You know, that's what they are. Um, and beyond that, um, they're pretty meaningless to the system and that in its way that system um, like our insurance systems and all the various rest are a pernicious kind of evil you know um, and I felt like that was a thing that I hadn't really seen tackled terribly much uh, partly because maybe it seems boring to say uh, you know the overbilling for for uh, meds is evil, like you kind of said, well, okay, how do you make that into something interesting? You just show a bunch of numbers on the paper. So, yeah. you know, but that for me, I felt like, okay, I, could, I think I could think of a way to talk about all of that. Um, and that uh, I think in a show, like six to eight episodes, you would have time to get into that. And also just as importantly to get in, and even more importantly, to get into the humanity, not only of the patients, but also of the staff. Uh, because the other thing that you often see is like the nurse ratchet kind of thing. Right, where she's a monster who destroys the wills of these uh, people. But my experience visiting units is almost all the staff, including the doctors, are vastly underpaid and asked to do way too much. And they're not protected in any way by the system around them. Um, and in fact, I think all of them are subject to some awful evil that is, a, that, is that system.
The problem is this 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 boring evil is so hard to fight because it's not flashy. It's not that's right. You know, so and it's about and I'm sorry. I was, I was no, gonna no, say please. in that's something I love from the book though, is um because now granted it's been probably five, six years since I read The Devil in Silver, but one of the things I love about it is how it humanized everything because I, I'm someone that uh, I deal with severe PTSD and I have to work through the VA system for it, right? So while the VA system is certainly not as bad as being on a medical hold and, and all those things, like I've seen that kind of, you have a doctor that wants to help you. Mm -hmm. The doctor is paid 50% of what the civilian world pays. Yep. So they're already going out of their way to try to help people. And they have 200 patients that they have to help. And they, it's not that they're trying to ignore you. It's that they, they can only do so much. Right. Right. And being able to, the way you were able to humanize both the staff, but also the patients, because in our lives, we all know people with mental illness, whether it's um, something severe, like, like an advanced form of schizophrenia or mm -hmm. someone um, who's dealing with severe autism. And those ones, it's easy to remember because they're so uh, affected. But if you're dealing with people with severe anger management issues, which... Um, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that the main character of the book, that's sort of how he ends up in there. Yeah. Um, it's easy for us to just cut those people out of our lives and we don't have to dehumanize them. We just forget them. Um, so a lot of people don't make the effort to go visit family members who are in those situations. And even if it's something like alcoholism or drug abuse, right? Like my own mother who passed away earlier this year, um, we basically had to sort of distance ourselves from her to keep ourselves safe and then it, all of a sudden you realize like oh, i haven't talked to my mom in six months right oh i haven't i haven't talked to her in almost a year now oh my gosh and then and then they're gone right so one of the things i loved about what you did with the book is you humanized those different elements and there is the story about the devil but i that's not the whole picture the whole For the sure. real whole picture is everything that's happening on the floor and as you said it's not as sensationalistic as one throws the cuckoo's nest uh, so much because something I could I could see reality I guess in, in the way you wrote it thanks a lot I really appreciate that and it really is the um like I think if like if if this adaptation possibility works out with the devil and silver one of the things that is going to happen is I am going to have to turn up essentially the devil right because it's for tv kind of thing but the conversations have been also about like, but that doesn't mean, but I, that's going to mean that I'm going to turn up the, the people too. Like it's not, it's not going to turn into the, exactly the thing that I was writing against, which is, you know, like you said, like the people don't matter. They're just bodies to die kind of thing. Um, uh, so thank you. I really appreciate you saying that. And like, uh, uh, it really was the whole, uh, like sometimes if I could say like the knock on that book, is it's horror, but it's not horror enough. And my feeling is like, I understand that point and I, I can hear it for the people who don't like it. That's their right to not like it. But to me, I feel like, but that systematic stuff is horrifying. And to me, it is terrifying to think exactly like you said, like six months or a year can go by and you realize I did it to save myself, but also what did I do to that person? By cutting them off and what what kind of maybe despair or loneliness or pain did they fall into and the point is not to say one was right or one was wrong but just to say everybody was dealing with like a bad hand yeah yeah um well before we move on to some more of your work um uh i discussed with you earlier that i would like to bring up the book to kill a mockingbird i really love the changeling uh, by the way, um, really, really love it. I did a lot of highlighting um, <laughs> in my Kindle when I read it. Um, and if I have time, I'd like to read a couple of passages. But but before I get to that, my wife's a high school English teacher. And she has loved the, this book all of her life. Um, to Kill a Mockingbird. Yeah, To Kill a Mockingbird, excuse me. And... Um, I, I think, you know, this has been a banned book for various reasons uh, over the years. And now it's not, I don't, I, not so much being banned as it is um, 
you know, well, we, we shouldn't teach this book because of it, there's a white savior in there saving the, uh, man, the person of color or at least right. trying to. Right. Um, and I, I was doing a little research on this because, she, you know, she doesn't agree. And uh, Sir, Sir Jeff Palmer, and I, and I sent this to you, had to say about it. He said, uh, and he, he's a black gentleman. We have to be careful here. Instead of removing this book from classrooms, we need to show how the book embodies the racism of its time. Um, you know, it was written in the 1960s and it's set in the 1930s, if I remember correctly. Um, that same racism that killed George Floyd, the injustice depicted in the text, uh, helps give us a view and understand why we still have racism today. If we hide it away, the fact is we are saying children are not capable of understanding. It's not white centric. Um, the fact is black people at the time were not able to defend themselves in court. Um, and I thought that was a really good point. At the same time, I also thought it's not up to me to decide this kind of thing, you know? Right. Um, and I really wanted to get your thoughts on it. My wife really, really wanted to get your thoughts on it. And that's why I asked you permission ahead of time. Right. Um, what you thought uh, of the book these days. Uh, well, you know, my, you know, so my feeling is, um, uh, I feel like that the, the ideal version of teaching that book would be teaching it alongside the book that was published just before she died or just, after she died, go set a watchman, mm -hmm. right? Which is the original uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. It's the book she tried to sell. Um, and the editor who bought it said, I don't like all of this, but I really like this bit about the father when she was young and there was a trial. What if you made something out of that? And she essentially made To Kill a Mockingbird out of that uh, editorial suggestion. But what is really interesting about um, Go Set a Watchman is if uh, To Kill a Mockingbird is the story of Scout as a child and her idealization of her father, Go Set a Watchman is about essentially Scout as a person in her 20s who is thinking and going back to her father and understanding how flawed a human being he was. Essentially, for all these ways that he was a fighter for justice and all this stuff, and he defended this black man when she was younger, he was also this virulent racist who supported uh, systematic oppression. So you can kind of understand why the editor, especially back then said, we don't want to read that book. Uh, we're not confronting that stuff at this age, in this time, right? But to my mind, I think the interesting thing is um, thinking about how one view, let's just say broadly speaking, right? This isn't every father, certainly not my father. Sure. But thinking about how a, tw uh, a 12 year old or so, I'm trying to remember exactly how old Scout is, um, views her powerful and successful father. And then thinking about how someone in their 20s views their powerful and successful father and feeling very similar, at least for myself, is how you might view this nation and how you might view the founding fathers or whatever it might be. And so I feel like there's a way to have a conversation about that book that says that first book is a classic in part because it's all about what's great about her father, but not at all about what's flawed about her father. And the second book is a harder sell because it's all about what's flawed about her father, but very little about what's good about him. And there's almost like a dream I had in my mind, like if she had decided to, if she had been able to write one more version of that book in her forties, let's say, when she could have, like at 12, you know, maybe you have the idealistic view of your parent. In your 20s, maybe you have your most down, like, look at this clown version of your parents. And if you're lucky, maybe in your 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever, you look at them and go, here's all of what they were, the good and the bad. And that's who they were. That's just them, you know. Uh, so to my mind, I feel like I, I, I would imagine curriculums in high schools or colleges might make it difficult to do this. But I feel like the dream version of teaching that book would be to teach to Kill a Mockingbird, and even like part of Go Set a Watchman, where you get to see her in that age talking about the same exact man 
And then being able to speak to students and say like, have you ever felt conflicted about your parents or your country or something? And how do you make peace with that? How do you deal with that? And what do you do when the country doesn't, or like your family doesn't want you to think complexly about the patriarch or the matriarch, or doesn't want you to think complexly about the nation as a whole? You know, how do you as a young person work through that? You know? I think that answers my question, and maybe this is a silly question, but um, you know, I was gonna ask, do you view the, both of these books as existing in, for lack of a better term, the same universe? Um, the, and, which yeah, two books? To, to uh -huh. Kill a Mockingbird and Go Set a Watchman. You know, was this, was Go Set a Watchman something that she wrote then she's just like no i don't i don't view the guy this way and i never want to get this published and and her um her estate published it if i remember correctly yes i think that's right yeah. um and but this was just sort of like notes that she never wanted really anyone to see or did she see him just like you know what you just said that he had these two sides and that scout saw these other sides when she got older well, she certainly, I mean, she tried to sell the book. So, I mean, it wasn't notes, okay. certainly. Uh, but at the same time, I totally understand. Like, uh, for me, in a way, um, I feel like from an anthropo anthropological level, it's fascinating, right? From a human level, um, the idea of when they did it and the idea that in her later years, Harper Lee was, um, was not in complete control of her mental faculties makes it certainly like um, more complex, if not troubling, right? Like, because right. she certainly had the power to publish that book in her lifetime, uh, right? Uh, so I don't know how she would have taken it, you know, but I feel like since we have it, and since I know it's not something that they pulled out of a drawer, it is actually something she tried to sell, but she, but the market essentially told her, we don't want this angry, judgmental, version we want you know and i think to kill mockingbird is overall like the better book like it's it's the better story because it's a simpler story but in relation to the other one i do think it's pretty fascinating and uh yeah i mean i don't know like um i don't know how she takes she's obviously famously private um so yeah. but i if i can say like i did meet her once you did Yes, I met her once, and in the if I can share this story because it's the most Please. random Please story do. on earth. Um, so I worked for like two years for a, uh, a used and rare bookseller, but like a very sort of low end guy, great guy, right? But like um, he sold occasionally some like big books that were you know worth a couple hundred or even a couple thousand. But for the most part, the way he made his money is that at like a library sale, let's say they've got a science fiction paperback for 25 cents. He sells it for 25 cents, but the postage is $3.25. Right, right. So he makes his money on the postage, you know, like it was that kind of business that we were a part of. A lot um, of people do that on Amazon. Yeah, that's right. And it's a fine way to make uh, a living, you know, a good way to make a living. Uh, uh, but it's not the sort of like Bauman's level rare books or anything. He's, he's not a book man. He, well, he's a book man. He's, he knows his stuff and all that stuff, but he's, um, but it's just not, it's not like, I don't know, whatever you call it, like private club book man. Right. It's like at the park setting up a table book man. Right. And I loved him dearly. Um, but uh, one day he comes back and in, he comes into the office, unbelievably excited. Uh, Cause uh, uh, he gets a, um, he finds it. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm telling it backwards. One day we get a phone call because we would have people also just call and, you know, call up and make buys. This is uh, before everything was internet related, right? This is uh, at the cusp of that, but people still call. So he gets this call one day from a woman uh, saying, I need you to buy me. I want to buy like these two uh, large print mysteries or something like that. And he says, okay. And he takes her information. He says, I need a card from you. And she gives him the card number and says, what's the name on the card? And she says, Harper Lee. And then he says, uh, I don't, I, can I just ask like, is this, are you the Harper Lee who wrote? Hey, can I just ask Harper? like, is this, says, yes, I am. And then he said, um, you know, I've only read two books in my life, like all the way through and To Kill a Mockingbird is one of them. And she says, well, thank you. I appreciate that very much. And then he said, listen, I'm just gonna shoot my shot here. Um, 
I happened to have in my warehouse, like kind of thing, in my storeroom, I have a first edition copy of To Kill a Mockingbird. Is there any chance you would sign it? And she famously did not sign. She did not do publicity, nothing like that. And then she said, well, I'll tell you what, Richard, Richard Rizman, she said, you mail it to me and you'll see if you get it. And he was like, all right, all right, I'll take that risk. And he actually found a second copy. Um, he found like one online and it had a dust jacket and everything. He mailed them both out. And then months passed, months. And then one day we get a call because there's like a security desk and the guy security says, there's a lady down here. She said, come down, she has some books for you. And then Richard says, come on down with me because I think he knew who it was, but he, had, he didn't tell me and Albert, the other guy working there. We go downstairs and there's this white lady in her sixties wearing like a purple windbreaker and has a very faint Southern accent. And she says, well, hello, Richard. My name is Harper Lee. It's nice to meet you. Here's your books. I was in town. And she just walked him over and handed him to him. And we shook hands and said, hello. And it was very wild to just be like, here's Harper Lee uh, on 110th and Riverside uh, Drive. Um, and then she just left and that was it. But I will say the, the beautiful part of that story to my mind is uh, uh, this bookseller and his wife, they were trying to adopt a child and they did adopt a child right around that time. And that child's name is Harper. Uh, they named him Harper. And uh, he sold the first of the two signed editions because they were like buying a house and it would help with a down payment. And then the second one, the one with the cover, signed first edition that's in perfect condition, is basically like his inheritance when he hits 18, or maybe now he might be 18. Uh, but that's my Harper Lee, meeting Harper Lee story. That is beautiful. Uh, which was really nice. That is beautiful. I really nice. That. And Thanks. totally, right, you know what I mean? Like it, and nothing to do with the writing world. And no, just to no, do with no. like the big seller. Telling that. Yeah, um, it was a lot great. of fun. Uh, my wife is watching. I'm sure she's getting a really big kick out of that. <laughs> so uh, last, and then we'll move on. But last but not least, uh, the, on, the, on the white savior thing um, in uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, it, 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 do you think teachers should still be teaching this book? Or do you think, that's a valid criticism. I oh, mean, but, uh, like Jeffrey, Sir Jeffrey said, I mean, there was no, there were no black attorneys to help at the time, right? Right. Well, I mean, to my mind, I think there's almost no book that shouldn't be taught, right? But uh, there's a lot of books that aren't taught without, taught without context or conversation about them, right? And that, in fact, uh, the idea of teaching to kill a mockingbird and then having a conversation about the idea of the white savior would uh, strike me as amazing. Or just the idea of the great man as a, as a idea like that one anointed guy is gonna show up and fix everything for everyone is its own interesting conversation because of how many times that has taken families, nations into some really bad places cults. because yes cults because we buy into that idea and to my so to me the only bad version of teaching a book any book really but especially a book that needs context is just to sort of read it and be like wasn't that great write an essay about how great Atticus Finch is that to me is the useless one but to say like let's talk about or to talk about idolatry uh on the part of Scout like uh, a question I often ask my writing students, uh, when students turn in their work, especially if the main character is good beyond belief, is do you believe this? Like, do you agree with this? As a reader, just as a reader, do you think this human being could be like this? And it's great because then the author gets to hear um, the ways that people, as much as we are trained to think about great, the great man who does this or the great woman or whatever it is, um, that there's a natural tendency to also go like, mm, I feel like they were hiding something or I didn't quite believe this, or, you know, because there's a skepticism potentially in us. 
And I like the authors, the students to hear that so that they can say, oh, I need to include that. I need to include room for the idea that people are wrong. Even good people are wrong. I, I love this. And I think Danielle will probably love this too. And any, any teacher who cares, any English teacher who cares will love this. It's, it, it, you know, you said something in the fact of almost any book can, should, should be taught or could be taught, but the key is, is it taught with context? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, and you know, he, he didn't fix it. He tried to fix it, but he didn't. Right. But, but at least he tried. Right. You know, at least he stood up and tried. So. And I feel like that's, and that's the best, you know, like the, the best, maybe on some of the best take on that, or the best lesson from all that is that, you know, maybe that's all anybody can do. Yeah. Right. But at least to try. Yeah. To oppose an injustice. Um, okay, so let's move on to uh, you, you. You were, uh, <laughs> I say this a lot, you don't have to do the David Copperfield thing. I was born, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, whether I should you know, turn out to be the hero of my own story and so on and so forth. But um, what was early life like for you? And then, you know, you went to high school and then, then college. And, and can you just maybe... Give me a rundown on anything that you feel comfortable sharing in regards to this. Uh, well, I mean, I am going to say I was born and raised in uh, Queens, New York. And you were uh, definitely born. So, And I was definitely born. Okay. Uh, right. And uh, I was raised in Queens, all around Queens. Um, and it's the location, it's the place I largely write about the most. Uh, uh, if not New York as a whole, although not always the case. Um, I went to college in upstate New York uh, at Cornell, and then I went to graduate school for my MFA in New York uh, at Columbia. And so I really never left New York until I was like 27 or 28. Um, and, uh, and I had a, or maybe I was like 25 or something like that. And I had a girlfriend who said like, I know you think you're worldly because you're from New York, but you haven't done anything. You haven't gone anywhere. And it was the beginning of me sort of breaking out of what I s s understood as the provincialism of just only knowing the place I know, right? And that I felt like that wasn't very healthy. And so, um, so, I've tra so I traveled a bit or as much as I could to try to see the world. And then I, and I started writing books when I came out of grad school. Um, um, I wrote a book of short stories, and then from there, it's been mostly novels. Um, was was that always what you wanted to do, Victor? Or did it is what I, I, since I was like 10 or 11, I was telling my mom and uh, my grandmother that I wanted to be a writer. And the person I didn't, like, certainly when I was little, it was like, I wanted to be like Stephen King or Clive Barker, uh, a little older, like Shirley Jackson, um, telling these stories um, that creeped people out but that they couldn't stop reading. Um, you had a couple of stumbling blocks, which you can talk about or not talk about, but reading between the lines, I, I saw that you, to me, it felt like you had those stumbling blocks mm -hmm. and you said, I'm not gonna let this stop me. I'm gonna get past this. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's hard. Cause like, I think in a way, um, I certainly, I mean, I think, as much as anyone else or to whatever degree had some stumbling box, um, like failed out of school and had to work, things like that. But um, in a way, I think because of um, growing up in a family with some pretty severe mental illness, um, the thing I came to more was I don't have, like the things that are making it, I would say genuinely impossible for some of the people I love to hold down full-time jobs, to be able to go to school, to take care of themselves or other people. I don't have that, those issues. And yet in many ways, sometimes they're, they seem more together than me. Mm -hmm. So what, what so in, 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 a, in a weird way, it was almost more like, um, uh, how dare you slip like this when you see these people you love working like, working themselves to the bone just to maintain like 
not getting kicked out of their homes, being able to go to work every day, being able to go to school every day. And then relatively speaking for whatever issues I've had, the, um, the I would say the deeper mental illness issues did not hit me. And it sort of felt like, come on, like you got to get it together at least a little bit and follow at least one of the things you want to do. And the thing, the only thing I really wanted to do was write stories. And so, so like undergrad, I just, like college, I didn't do well. I failed out and um, kind of fell apart, but then pulled it together just enough to get into grad school. And when I started grad school, like really that was me saying like, uh, whether this was true or not, it felt as though every other opportunity before this, I had shit the bed. Yeah. And this is the last opportunity you're gonna have because you're just gonna spend this time. You're working a part-time job and you're writing. If you can't do this right, then you just can't do it. You just can't do anything, you yeah. know? And I, my fear was I would just become one of those like angry high school teachers to, be, to speak of a, uh, like a good high school teacher loves the way that they're working with students. The angry high school teacher, you know, blames these high school students for the reasons that they didn't get things done. Yeah. And I didn't want to be one of those folks. I realized like that's the path I was on. I, gra- I would scrape by with an English degree and then I would sit there for however many decades blaming my kids because I wasn't doing stuff. Uh, it's a cliche to say never give up, but I just so firmly believe in that. I also firmly believe in, and you did both of these things, the laser beam power of a focus. Mm-hmm. The, the, the writing was, I, I want to be a writer. I want to be a successful writer, whatever that means to me. Right. But the, I want to do this and I'm not going to stop till I do it. We all get, we all get dealt different cards in life, right? Right. Some of us uh, get dealt a minority card and then those who are white, some, some, if not most, never understand the things that the minorities go through that they don't even have to think about. True. You know? um, and or some get dealt the card of never had the ability to go to college or, you know, these, all these different things, but, but the key is you can look at that and those are your excuses, or you can say, no matter what, that's my, that's my signpost. I'm walking towards it no matter what. And if I, if I find myself walking this way and I've, 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 I've gone the wrong way, then I correct. I just course correct. And for sure. I was correcting until I make it. For sure. And also, I would say another part of that is also uh, within reason, being able to also in, understand what you also get, like from being like, if you're like, there's the, the narratives about being born in whatever, being uh, born uh, neurodivergent, being born non-white, being born non-male, being born and having uh, no money, whatever it is, that there are the narratives about that where you talk about what you didn't have or what you lost, but there's also the exact same, on the other side of it, there's also the narratives about what you got, the culture that you grew up in, the things that you saw that are yours and that are unique to you and that um, you can also feel pretty sure not very many other people have because they didn't grow up with what you got. Right, and that those things, you know, this is its own cheesy thing, but those things that 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 could be called um, uh, uh, lacking or or problems can also be turned into things that are your strengths and that are your beauty and are your and all that. And feeling like that was another part of it was also realizing like I wasn't going to be for lack, you know, I wasn't going to be a working class white guy from Maine to just use Stephen King say as an example, and to spend some time as a teenager thinking like, so then does that mean I just can't write? And then it takes time to go like, no, but I am a black kid from Queens. And that's something. Cause there's not many people doing this black kid from Queens thing from this mixed community who's also bringing in this mental illness stuff and also bringing in immigrants. And all of a sudden it's just like, oh, I got a, I got a toolkit here that not many other people have. 
And so there's also that part of it is to, it, to say like, oh, that's also my, that's mine, you know? You're writing you. And like, and that those are, those are whoever you, I don't know, whatever it is, uh, raised in Oklahoma and the beauty of that, uh, raised in a military family and learning the beauty of that, like all those things made life hard. And then sometimes, and then also sometimes those things are like, but that's mine. I you think know? it was, it was either John or Laird I was talking to recently. And uh, somehow we got on the subject of, uh, I don't remember if it was a Patreon podcast or a regular podcast about, uh, yeah, it was Laird because he was talking about Alaska and then being in upstate New York, you know, and how places get in your blood. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're talking about um, to some degree. For sure. That's what you're writing about. You know, I think about, uh, I, I'm from Iowa and it's in my blood. Mm -hmm. um, I'm living in Texas right now, but I know one day I think they'll get back up there yeah. and I can, I can be patient and I can wait until that happens, you know? Right. Um, but it's, it's in my blood. I, there's the, uh, I will bring up Superman once again, <laughs> and Zack Snyder's justice league, you know, after Superman gets resurrected and he flies with, with Lois Lane and he goes home. I don't know if you saw it or not. I saw it, yeah. Yeah, I, I loved it. Um, and uh, he he goes home and gradually realizes, remembers who he is. And um, they go inside and, and Lois gets a shirt out of a box for him to put on because he doesn't have a shirt on. And she tells him that his mom, Martha, lost the farm. She couldn't keep up with the payments. And Clark says, I don't understand. And he goes, she goes, Lois goes, she's a proud woman, Clark. And he keeps every moment, he keeps remembering more and more. You can tell uh, that that uh, um, Henry Cavill and Zack Snyder did this beautifully. They did this on purpose. And Clark says, she, she loved it here. And then he goes something like, he kind of goes like this with his head. And he goes, so did I, so did I. And you know, the next scene he's out there in the field and he's, he's got his fingers and he's sort of rubbing gently the, the corn stalks. And you can see how much he loves where he is. Right. And yeah, places get in your blood. And if you're a writer, you do write about them. That's right. So, and if you're a musician, you play music about them. And yes. You know, if you're an artist, you do the same thing. For sure. And you know. I feel like it goes across, if you're a welder, or, you know, like, I don't know. I mean, that there's a million ways that people show the place they're from, you know, in their manners even. Yeah. And all that kind of stuff. Um, someone that I think a lot of, uh, you know, we, we have people who watch live, you know, quite a few, but a lot more who watch later. Uh, right. you're, you're one of those people. Yeah. Then a hell of a lot more who, who listen later uh, on iTunes and, um, you know, Spotify, whatever, right. uh, because they can listen on the go. Right. Well, getting back to the people who are watching right now, Linda Addison is one of them. Um, hey, Linda. Yes, I love her. And... She says, tears in my eyes, walking the path given and being focused on creating no matter what. Um, and uh, Kat says, Linda, I literally have chills running down my spine listening to the interview. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have my wife and son watching and, and giving me shit. So. <laughs> As they should. That's the balance. It can't be all. It can't be all chills and oh, come on. Uh, and love. I, I I tell you what. I talk about my wife so much on this show. She <laughs> touches lives every day. Yeah. You know how many how many kids, decades from now, will remember a moment with her that made their day and was a small turning point in their life. Mm -hmm. You know, not a lot of people can say that. For sure. You know, and that's the way she feels about her kids. And that's how she treats her kids. You know, you mentioned those angry teachers that are there just because 
they failed or didn't try hard enough at what they really wanted to do. Right. Um, I see some of those teachers um, and then I see teachers like her who are yeah. doing it because that's exactly what they want to do. They want to that's touch right. lives. And so, so yeah. Um, all right. So let's talk about um, what are some of your, uh, uh, what are some of your all time favorite authors and, and books then limit this first question to, um, writers who are no longer working, you know, for example, they're dead and they can't write anymore, that kind of thing. Right. Uh, what are some of your influences and some of your favorite authors and books from writers who are not working um, today? Uh, well, uh, you know, the funny thing is you even prompted me and told me we were gonna, you were gonna ask this question. I sat downstairs, uh, uh, we watched, earlier today we watched, um, my kids asked if we could watch the Brendan Fraser Mummy. Uh, oh, that's a good, that's a good fun movie. It's fun. We made it about 45 minutes and they were like, this is boring. And I was like, all right, what can I do? I'm sorry. But, you know, they've said that a number of times before about other things. And then we come back a year or two later and we dive back in. And yeah. uh, so I think because it is, I think, like that, just that right mix of like action, comedy, a little horror. Um, well, your anyway. kids are more important than me. Let me just say that. <laughs> no, but the reason I bring that up is to say, like, while we were watching, I was writing down the answers to these questions and then I left it over by the TV. Uh, so uh, it's easy, you know, you so know these things, but it's easy to forget them that's on right. the spot. That's right. So, like, but I, let me, so certainly a few of them uh, who are gone. I mean, I, I think like uh, uh, Ralph Ellison, uh, Invisible Man would be certainly one of them. Um, uh, Algernon Blackwood, uh, I mentioned Shirley Jackson already uh, as being someone I love. Octavia Butler, I came to later. Uh, cause I wasn't a sci-fi person. Um, so I only got to her in like college, uh, but loving her. Um, I, I uh, heard that you're a huge fan of Ambrose Bierce. I love Ambrose Bierce dearly. Yes. Uh, particularly the, I mean, I love the devil's dictionary, but also the, um, all the civil war stories. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, in a way, like I know he's got the horror stuff and it's, it's wonderful, but in a way, the Civil War stories are even more horrific uh, for the way that they're just like ravages of war, and he just lays I them. I recently out. started going slowly through uh, again. It's been years, but going through again. Uh, can can such things be? Such things be true, or uh, can, can such, such things such happen? Things be, yeah. Can such things be right. Yeah, which is a, a collection of his. Yeah, he's, I mean, I just felt like, uh, you know, I mean, he was such a wonderful writer, such a caustic human being uh, in a way that I admire. And then who can beat that end of life mystery? Like who's I, got a better story gonna, than yeah, that? I was gonna bring that up next. Like literally nobody, I can't think of another writer who has a better story than they just rode off on a horse. And then nobody knows. And disappeared. Yeah, I, I mean, you can't you can't beat that, you know. Yeah. So rode off onto the sun into the sunset and said, "You will, you guys will never know what happened to me." And became a legend, became a myth, you know. He, wait, wait a second, didn't he write a story very similar to that a year or two earlier? about somebody disappearing? Yeah, I it's very he, possible. I, I wouldn't put it did. past him. I think he did, but I'm my, my I am going way back in my memory when I when I say that. Yeah. Um, what about, uh, and it, this is a dangerous question because inevitably someone you really love on the spot, you'll accidentally leave out, but um, what are some of the writers working today um, that you really enjoy, really admire, and some of the books maybe that you've read in the last year or two that you really would like to mention that you, that you uh, really enjoyed? Well, uh, you know, this particular, this question in particular, I have been thinking like, especially as time has gone by and I feel like I've become friends or friendly with so many folks within horror, right? It, it feels even more fraught. And so then I thought to myself, well, maybe I should just name writers I love outside of horror so that uh, uh, I get to have a little space. But then I thought, oh, that's kind of cheating. But um, so I would say, so there's a writer named Gail Jones, who's uh, just one of my all time favorite writers. She has a novel that just came out like, 
two weeks ago called Palmares. I'm, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it. Uh, and she hadn't had a she hadn't had a book in about 20 years. So it's her first one since then. Uh, and her first novel was a novel called Corregidora, which is just one of my all time all time favorite novels. Uh, a little bit literary, a little bit horror, a little bit historical and political. It's kind of everything. Um, and so she's great. There's uh, Anne Carson, uh, and in particular, a book called The Autobiography of Red, uh, which is like a kind of a narrative poem about essentially like a, a Titan or a demigod. Uh, and it's like wild and beautiful and like disturbing and confusing and all the good ways. And uh, both of those writers are like, I guess they would be probably called poetic. And there's just something lovely about uh, living in folks who live in their language in that way, you know? And then, I mean, uh, since I didn't want to cheat on it, uh, we mentioned Linda Addison, so I love Linda's work for sure. Uh, I mean, very recently, Stephen Graham Jones and uh, Sylvia Moreno Garcia both did just an amazing work. Um, Nadia Bulkin, Elizabeth Hand. Um, uh, Nadia Bulkin wrote a story for me for Autumn Cthulhu that's called uh, there is a bear in the woods. It's yeah. Absolutely. She is such a great writer. Absolutely. She is. Story. For sure. Uh, then, I mean, obviously, Laird and John are off, often on the show. Uh, I'm a fan of both of theirs, certainly. Uh, did I say Lydia Llewellyn is a buddy and a writer I love? Sarah Langan. Um, uh, there's um, a novel called, uh, it's not new, but uh, My Sister, the Serial Killer. I'm a... Uh, I'm blanking on the author's name right now, but it's a familiar. wonderful book, wonderful book. Um, uh, so those are at least some of the ones yeah. I would name. Uh, I love interviewing Livia Llewellyn, by the way. She's, she's just so open with her feelings. And uh, I, I did uh, what I call a, a deep background Patreon podcast. With I know, her. I listened to it. Did you? Yes, Isn't that wonderful. I was great. I, I mean, I particularly loved hearing about the adventures in the town where she grew up. And uh, well, who was it she dressed up as? She dressed up as Kolchak. Uh, Kolchak. That's right. Kolchak. That's right. Now that was a wonderful interview. Thank, you, thank you. But I give all the credit to Livia. I mean, now, Livia, if you're listening, I still do not have those pictures of you as a kid dressed up as Carl Kolchak. I, w I will not stop bothering you until i get these every time i ask her she's like yeah my mom is being slow on this i'm like yeah i'm not buying it yeah <laughs> no that that was a really great interview so yeah she, i like i love talking with her um what about uh it, it you know it's so funny that you mentioned the brandon fraser mummy movie because two it was like two days ago i thought I think I'm in the mood to watch that again. It's been a few years. That's just mm -hmm. like this popcorn movie, you know. Um, and uh, but what are some? Well, it doesn't have to be recent, but what are some of your favorite horror movies and horror television shows? Well, I recently, <clears throat> like just yesterday, I, fi I finished Midnight Mass. Mm -hmm. I thought it was just wonderful. I really, I, I loved it, and uh, kind of how it built and where it ended up. And uh, again, like this might be a, a similar thing I was saying about Devil and Silver, like uh, certainly, especially the first few episodes are very talky and people are really debating faith and religion and what it means. And I know that's not for everybody when it comes to like horror or just in general to life, but I loved, loved just hearing just the people talking, especially when they were debating stuff. Um, like uh, different takes on like, what happens when we die and all this. I, I like, uh, f like thinking of the spending time at the local bar, like I don't really, I'm pretty antisocial. So I really don't talk to people. When I would go to my local bar, I just would sit there with a book. But what I loved uh, more than anything was just hearing people and just hearing the ways people just get into whatever it is, you know, like uh, whether they're flirting with each other on a first date or they're arguing over like whether they should invest their entire life savings in Bitcoin or something. Uh, 
I do just enjoy hearing people take like just chop it up with each other, you know. And um, yeah, Midnight I'm Mass has that. started going to coffee shops to write, and yet it's, at first you you uh, put some headphones over your ears to block out the the talking and everything, and then you quickly changed that and became interested in the conversations around you. Yes, that was actually when I was working on. I uh, it might. Have, it could have been on working on the devil and silver. Yeah. Um, and then the particular Dunkin' Donuts where I was working was full of like uh, people who could have easily been in the unit. I'll put it that way. Uh, and so it was kind of nice to listen in, um, in a way, just to be reminded of the complexity and the humanity of everybody, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so anyway, so midnight mass, I think for, if anyone hasn't seen this on Netflix, uh, it's a slow burn, but I really think it pays off by the end. Cha uh, Chapel Wait is going on right now. Chapel Wait, I don't know that one. Chapel Wait is Adrian Brody. Okay. And it's uh, it's um, supposedly it's a uh, an adaptation of Jerusalem's Lot by Stephen King. Really? Yes. Okay. Um, it doesn't stick to the story real well. It does and it doesn't, but. Um, it uh what it does do it does it very well i think okay uh, i personally think it's superior to midnight mass okay um and of is course, it a limited series or yes yeah yeah, yeah. I, it's just about over i think it's on its seventh episode it come, there's one episode a week coming out okay i think it's on bridges is on amazon prime is that right i think that's right chapel weight yeah is on epics epics that's right. okay yeah. yeah i think the first two episodes are free on another streaming service but to watch the whole season you have to get epics now. okay that's right the first two yeah. are free on amazon prime i believe and of course you can get epics through the app or through amazon. you can get it through amazon prime right but, but, yeah, yeah i watched uh, their war of the worlds that was what made me uh, a buddy recommended the i think it's a french war of the worlds remake i watched some of that yeah it had some good things about it. And then other ways I thought it was a little uh, uh, slow. Yeah, you too. <laughs> in a way that didn't serve it, I don't think. Yeah. So, but, and then uh, as far as, you know, like I, I, I do, I adore uh, Shudder as just a streaming service. I think they're, they're doing amazing stuff. Um, particularly, uh, I've loved, there was a, uh, I think it's a Dutch horror movie I can look it up in a minute, but it's basically about a f it's basically about a family where just I would say like the equivalent of like uh, a vagabond shows up and just destroys their lives, uh, and there's just and each step of the way there's there's more and more that his presence sort of uncovers and reveals. And by the end, it just kind of goes full. Like you just kind of go, oh wait, that's that's where this was going. Yeah. Whoa. Okay. Stormer. I'll look it up. I'll look it. Up. And then the whaling is my. Uh, if the thing is my childhood all-time favorite movie, I think horror movie. I think or movie. Um, I think in more recent years, like the last ten years, my favorite movie is The Whaling. It's a Korean uh, horror movie that I think is just amazing and it's like four movies in one which is exactly what i love in a movie yeah. uh it's like all about belief and doubt about xenophobia but then it's super disturbing and gross it's it's called the wailing the wailing yeah okay i'll have to check that out it's amazing it's i never i can never stop saying enough good things about that movie okay. it's funny too it's and then where it goes at the end is just so I'm actually writing it down right now so that I don't don't forget about it. So why do you think that? Why do we why do we like to read horror and watch horror, um, for that matter, write horror, or edit horror? You know, why why are we so interested? What draws us to it? I took, I mean I wonder this question for like the same thing for romance, historical fiction, literary fiction, spy thriller, right? Like 
for there are some people who I'm sure read everything, right? But I think a lot more people are kind of specialists in maybe two or three things, right? That maybe overlap, maybe don't. And I guess all I can say for, I can only speak for myself. And I, I feel like, um, especially maybe talking about, so I, uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of mental illness in the family. So it was a somewhat chaotic household, I guess would be the way I'd put it. And one of the things I appreciate about horror, as opposed to almost every other genre, is that it acknowledges that chaos can just enter a home and wreck everything. And sometimes it's defeated and sometimes it isn't, you know, and almost every other genre, I think, um, or at least, and this may be my own ignorance from not having read every genre, right? But I feel like there's more of a sense of agency as opposed to horror, which at least for me, the horror I love is often about like something just, we just came upon something or something just came upon us and, it, and it's here now and what do we do? Uh, and I really appreciated like when I was a kid, I, I mean, I was drawn to like, say, Stephen King and Clive Barker and all that, because I felt like the books I was supposed to be reading, I don't know, Robert Louis Stevenson, things like this, not to denigrate them in any way, um, but the stories felt too ordered for me, right? Like uh, you go on an adventure and then you have some ups and downs and then you resolve that thing, or you meet a person and they come to your town and... Everything's going to be all right in the end. You know. But even I would say even to say like um, the like the reasons for things were often like uh, well I'm a spy and I've been hired by this agency and I'm going to go stop the bad guys who are doing this thing and it felt like honestly like the movie that I adored so much when I was young was Poltergeist uh, in a way the part that I liked the least was the very end when you have like it's the dead bodies who were buried here and blah, blah, blah. I kind of liked it more that you just moved into this house and there's all these lonely, needy spirits and they just found this girl and they just came for her, you know? And that sense of just like, cause it's a really on some level, it's a movie more about the parents, right? And about like, I can't protect her. What's the greatest horror I could have is that my child is gonna be vulnerable and everything I do actually fights, uh, actually um, fails. The more I try to protect, the worse it's gonna get. Yeah, because you they want that quite a bit in the, in the changeling. And yes. Stories. Yeah. And so I, so I love horror because of that, I mean, certainly other people love horror for their own reasons, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, but I, I think like, I just like that it's just sort of like, sometimes it's just the bad things just come. With, with cosmic horror, there's also, of course, this, in addition to the horror, there's this feeling of awe, I think, that's, that's sort of an awe mixture of horror, and you don't know where one begins and the awe ends, and yeah. vice versa. Um, I read somewhere recently that people who watch horror movies, for example, or, or read horror, um, that's a way for them to let go of stress in a safe way sure you know the stress in their lives and they let go of the the stress in a safe way also it just me just speaking for me personally real quickly um you know how it, it, have you experienced this i think we all probably have when you have a really bad dream a bad nightmare and you wake up and you're back in the normal world with your family that that loves you and everything and you're like Oh my God. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. You know, the nightmare was horrible, but the waking up from it, uh, you almost appreciate things more if that's sure. if that's sure. not simplistic. But I've certainly had that feeling upon waking up from nightmares many a time. Yeah. You know, you know I, I'm glad that wasn't real. I'm glad I'm back in the real world, you know. Right. So right. um Let's see here. Uh, wanted to yeah. 
do you have a do you have a favorite kind of horror like for me personally i like quiet horror for example mm-hmm. um you know bradbury charles l grant that sort of thing uh or do you just you know, horror in general and you're all over the map no i would say like old school cosmic like algernon blackwood arthur mack and like that is like a real sweet spot uh uh, for me, and then all the sort of children of those, uh, of writers like that in that vein where, you know, uh, obviously one one of the reasons I like them is because certainly Lovecraft didn't invent cosmic horror, right? He's just, uh, it's another sort of uh, branch on that tree kind of thing. Um, but in a way, I think it's tied to what you were talking about with awe, um, but it's, um, to sort of look at look at the face of the of the world and tremble, as opposed to look at the face of the world and smile or applaud, and uh, I'm I'm just I am a real sucker for that. I mean I love a good ghost story. Um, demons are always fun. Uh, I think I'm probably the thing I'm I think I'm least sort of maybe taken by like slasher kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, unless it's a unless unless the slasher like um like if there's reasons for it do you know what i mean like those are the ones i can i really enjoy i can enjoy where it goes into like another um like just feeling like even slashers uh for me i, I like the best when they have some kind of psychology to them so you understand like even as a malevolent force. I mean, I think Freddy in the first movie has a profound psychological sort of journey, especially when you you begin with thinking he's just a monster killing these kids. And then the mom tells the story about how we burned him alive. And you go, oh, that's why he's mad. And then she says, but we burned him alive because he was assaulting our children. And you go, oh man, this is complicated. You know, like... I mean, as a parent too, I feel like, no, I get it, burn them alive, but then it's the horror again of like, um, but it's the horror again of like, and that still won't keep your children safe. And you know what I mean? Like, uh, and that that first one, as po- I enjoyed the other ones, but the other ones for me, they don't have that kind of bite. It, 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 please correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like that you do return to that theme a lot uh it's on my mind a lot certainly of of keeping your children safe yes uh, i would character, say so yeah one character tells another and i don't want to uh spoil anything but in the changeling one character tells another about you know fairy tales and that rapunzel at its core is about keeping your children safe and explains why and, and yeah. so forth um uh, i really enjoyed the changeling by the way Thanks. There's this really, uh, there's this, this creeping sort of dread when you're reading it that you know something is going wrong and you're not sure what the hell it is, you know. And by the way, uh, Victor, guys, Victor reads the audiobook version of this and you do a fantastic job with it. Thanks. I had a good director. Good. Well, she helped a lot. Um, there are a lot of authors that I, I think, hey, you know, you should have, <laughs> you should have hired other talent. Man. You're, you're a great writer, but maybe you shouldn't have read this. But with yours, I thought, man, he's doing a great job with this. Thanks. I, well, I read part of it and I listened to part of it. So, you know, I will say the other part of there's two other realities. There's like one sometimes, certainly like my earlier books. Uh, they're they are not on audiobook because the publisher was like, it's not worth it, like to pay somebody to do it and even to pay to record it, right? So that's one aspect. And then uh, like when the changeling came up, uh, it was, uh, they were saying like, do you want to essentially audition to do the thing? And then I said, uh, do you pay? Like, do you pay the person? And I said, they said, yeah. And I'm the child of an immigrant. I was like, I'll do the job. I want to make that money. If there's money on the table, I want to make it. And so then it turned, and thankfully I passed the audition. Uh, so, um, and they would have, so, and they seemed very open to telling me, they would have been very willing to say no 
this stinks. But like if the opportunity was there, it's like, let me try, you know? No, you did a great job. Oh, thanks. I, I'd like to, if you bear with me, I'd like to read a couple of uh, highlights from the Changeling. Um, a thought, an idea, a shared dream. Parenthood is a story two people start telling together. I, I think that's just beautiful. Um, here's another one I really liked. Unsupervised reading is a blessing for a certain kind of child. Um, really related to that. Um, something that I cannot relate to, but reading it had empathy for as much empathy as I can without ever being in the situation was uh, um, you're talking about um, uh, Apollo as a 12 year old walking around New York trying to sell his books mm -hmm. and it, every kid with uh, excess melanin became a super predator even a black boy with glasses and a back backpack full of books um, and then some bookstores wouldn't even let him in because he was black and uh, to make things I'm quoting again to make things worse, Apollo would find himself wondering if he actually was frightening a monster, the kind that would drive his own father away. You know, it's easy to see where his, this starts. His, his father disappears when I, th I think he's four, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And then, you know, it, it's easy for him to see how people are just rejecting him, won't even let him in because it, it, it's so very well put. How is this kid different from other kids? He's got more melanin in his skin. Mm -hmm. That's it. And when you put it that way, it's so ridiculous. You know, he's a human being. Lighter skinned kids are human beings. Right. You know, and, you know, I, I, I told Linda this. I said, I can't ever understand what it's like to go through these things but at least i can hopefully listen when someone of color is trying to tell me hey this is what i go through and not just dismiss it right you know right so um um i have highlighted so much here but it's just a, it's a wonderful book I really appreciate that. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm grateful that those things, uh, you know, uh, community, like, it, you know, like a, it's such a weird thing to think that you put some words down one day and you're kind of hoping that like the whole book, but even sentence by sentence is just, uh, what do you call it? Letters in a bottle. And if you're lucky, they reach another person, they open it and it communicates feeling to them. And what a, what a wild kind of like, I can understand why writers like Grant Morrison and Alan Moore talk about the act of writing or, or producing work as magic, as a magic system, because it is amazing to think that some writer who's been dead for a hundred years wrote a sentence that I'll now read at my home in the Bronx and I'll be moved, scared, yeah uh enthused whatever it is like that's that's magic that's a very magical thing i heard described as one once um you have one person in a room alone and he's encoding words onto a typewriter or a computer or a laptop that months later years later decades later maybe centuries later touch somebody else in a room reading alone mm -hmm. those same words for sure and that just that's always stuck with me um here's another this is just magical writing victor really um i'm quoting now again uh from chapter 38 a fairy tale moment the old kind um when such stories were meant for adults not kids um and then there's one more if you'll bear with me, I just got to find it. Oh, here it is. Chapter 36. I passed over it. It was like catching a glimpse of the glittering soul inside a rumpled passenger on a subway train. Um, I, I, you know, just 
so beautiful. Thanks. I really appreciate that. You know, and it, I, I don't have the words. Uh, to, I relate to that feeling, but I don't have the words to say how I relate to that feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, every person that you pass by is another universe to themselves. For sure. Um, there's a book coming out called The Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows. Uh, maybe you've heard of it, but basically this guy, um, he made up a lot of words um, for emotions that we don't have words for. Uh, one of them, is, one of the more famous ones is one that's called Sonder. Mm -hmm. And it's this realization that every living being around you is the star of their own life, of their own play. And whereas you may appear as an extra in a mm -hmm. coffee shop getting coffee, in a car passing by, um, in a lighted window at dusk. Yeah. Um, but each, each, every person on earth is that is that different universe and that different uh, set of memories and personality. Yes. So. For sure. You know, and I thought of that word Sonder when I read that quote, you know, the glittering soul in, in, uh, inside that a rumpled passenger. Yeah. So. Um, I've talked a lot. Ben and Bridget, do you guys have questions for or comments for for Victor? Yeah, I mean, I this could go on for 12 hours if I really wanted to, you know, to go into it. Um one of the things that I was uh I mean, so just on the topic you were just on, I was just thinking about the show uh, The Last Kingdom, which is based on the story when Alfred the Great sort of unites um England um against the Vikings. And one of the Vikings that like he conquers um, Westminster and sort of pushes him out. And then he goes into Alfred's writing room and he sees all the scrolls everywhere and reports from all over the country. And he's sort of in awe, like, oh, my God, he can communicate with people hundreds of miles away. Um, and that's I'm sort of was sort of thinking about that. And that was ultimately what led to the Vikings defeat. Mm. Um, but I was thinking of when you were talking about the horror. Um, there's something about our lives, right, where we're. When things are going good, we want to read like a really good horror story. And when things go bad, we want escapism, right? We want to go read a, a superhero comic or, or something. And that's sort of something that um, lately the horror industry has contracted, right? Because the world itself is not a fun place. Um, I'm looking at people walking around me in masks right now, right? It's mm. We're still in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so I, I definitely wonder how much of that is an element as well, where when you're growing up, um, and my my background, um, as you mentioned, we have different backgrounds, but I grew up in a lower middle class neighborhood in Stockton, California, full of crime and gang violence. Um, and that was definitely something that when I had tough times, I had hundreds of comic books next to me. And when I had good times, there was I read every Stephen King novel that was ever written. Right. Um, uh, have you read Revival by chance? Mike, don't don't. Just don't, don't, don't go there. Okay. No, we don't have time. We look. Victor is going to have to get back to his family eventually. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. All right. Um, we, so we can't keep him too long. We we got to wrap this up before too long. Yeah, right. So I was thinking of in the Ballad of Black Tom, which uh, Mike hasn't really brought up yet, but yeah, that was my next. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a way you handle the horror in that. That um, I, I would actually juxtapose it with, say, Alan Moore, for example, right? Like when Alan Moore is addressing the Lovecraftian idea of horror, to him, it's more of like, well, Lovecraft's just hiding the sensational side of horror, right? That the secret cult orgies are literally orgies, and that's why people are drawn into it. Mm -hmm. And you sort of had a different explanation because of your background. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I'm thinking of like how those different ways that we see horror or maybe the way we experience horror that we're reading, even if we're reading the same story, sometimes the aspects that scare us. So um, pet cemetery by Stephen King, I mm -hmm. can't read it as a parent. Right. Um, the, the idea of losing a child to me and having it described in detail, I can't, it, it's too much. Yeah. It'll, it bothers me. Um, so that, that was another detail I was thinking. And then um, at some point, you should discuss, you wrote a post on when you took your kids to see Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Mm -hmm. um, 
And for those that don't know uh, or haven't seen it, it's an amazing animated film that came out three years ago, I think, two years ago. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and well. the way you explained how your kids reacted to the film uh, really touched me, because I loved it too. I thought it was a great film. But you touched on aspects that because of my background, I didn't see. I've never lived mm-hmm. in a world where Spider-Man didn't look like me. Mm-hmm. And that, sure, your kids already like Spider-Man, but having a Spider-Man that they could better relate to accentuates the story right and so i just really appreciate the things you had to say there because again i i've never lived in a world where superman batman everyone you know pretty much all my favorite superheroes all look like me so it's kind of easy for me to gloss over and not see i don't want to use charged uh terms here but not see how that could kind of like blind me to some of the aspects and i can see that with Ballad of Black Tom, you did that with the horror, with aspects. It was like, well, why would anyone ever join this cult? You make it clear why people would do that. And it was yeah. amazing. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And, uh, you know, I have to say, like, um, uh, as far as the idea of, like, the all the superheroes and all, uh, uh, I feel like the sometimes the, the push and pull of all that is, you know, uh, um, the argument from the folks who just say, like, well, just make a, another Batman, just make your own Batman, make your own Superman, make your own whatever. Um, but, it, and that's fine. Certainly there are wonderful characters who, uh, who um, like uh, for me, uh, you know, um, uh, my, my Green Lantern is black uh, and always was, it's not Hal Jordan. Uh, by any stretch, you know, from uh, the Green Lantern Mosaic comics, that series, uh, was where I found my Green Lantern and loved John, him dearly. I can't remember his last name. Uh, John, John Stewart. Yeah. John Stewart. John Stewart, yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, 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 so those things exist, but it, uh, what's also true is like you also think about like um, all the apparatus that goes into making sure that's, that that uh, no, it's not just like, hey, this is good. It's also like, hey, this is the one you get, uh, right? And um, so I just, I feel like it's a, it's like an ongoing project and I've been really enthused to see, like, speaking specifically of like superhero comics and superhero movies, um, the ways that uh, um, people have been willing to embrace these, this kind of character, that kind of character. And it's always sort of, expanding but uh, you know it's it's just a, a a lifetime process and beyond one lifetime's process um but in black tommy i felt like the 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 horrors in there there were so many ways to see like with almost any situation to say like i said i, I tell my students are you sure this is the right like in the lovecraft in the original um horror at red hook essentially the reason they join the cult is because they're just evil swarthy monsters you know, and as a writing teacher, I get to say, could there be another reason that people might, you know, like uh, similarly, I don't know, like uh, I'm always like I had a buddy who moved, who's been living down in uh, Florida for well, she was living there for meant for like a decade, and she talked about moving from she's raised in upstate New York to moving to Florida, and one of the great culture shocks was her for her was the depth of anti-union sentiment. Right. And she just couldn't understand. She grew up in like a union town in Albany where there's so many. And, you know, it had its own corruption issues or whatever. But the narrative that she would hear down there is just like, uh, well, why would I need a union? I already make 18 bucks an hour, whatever. And she would be like, you could make 36 bucks an hour. And you could not be fired just because your boss doesn't like you. Like that's what the union uh, uh, could do for you. You know, it could protect you and all that. But, um, uh, but, but I'm sure. But whatever narratives they have, that's the narrative that they had. You know, and just that's like as a result, there's all these other stories you can tell. Well, why did the uh, why did the Ensmith people go from worshiping the Christian God to worshiping Dagon? There was a very um, materialistic reason mm. because they started getting fish and gold. Mm. You know, right. it, because it benefited them. Right. You know, there, there was a reason. I think, I mean, I do think any kind of story that acknowledges that even the quote unquote bad guys should have logical reasons for their choices. 
mm-hmm. is going is there's a decent chance that's going to be a good story. Yeah. You know. Is, is yeah, there I, an, is there a father in Ensmith going, you know, okay, I don't really like this Dagon <laughs> guy. He seems like an asshole of a god, but I need to feed my kids. I got to feed my kids. You know, it's just it, it yeah. So well, it's definitely something that I feel, especially today, a lot of people just have trouble with that, seeing an alternate perspective. And mm-hmm. I think of, um, so, you know, I'm Catholic and I bring my daughter who's 16 and she goes to a very, uh, again, I hate using politically charged terms, but very progressive school. Mm-hmm. And it, it's not like I'm a, I'm not a Republican or anything, but it's, she goes to church and then she's like, oh, well, these people, they're anti-abortion, but they're not like they're not crazy. And it's like, okay, you, you can disagree, but try to see, well, maybe they have a reason you don't understand. Mm -hmm. And it's not that they're a bad person. I think of when you were talking about midnight mass, I read a review this morning of someone that was angry and felt betrayed because midnight mass didn't make religion look bad enough. Right. Because Mike Flanagan was trying to address why people, because he has a, he's, he's an atheist, Mm -hmm. but he's trying to address like, why would you be attracted to this? Why would you approach it? Um, and, and I think in our culture today on, on all sides, that's sort of, we, re, we resist this, right? So that's one of the things I appreciated about your work is seeing a perspective that I don't naturally have. Yeah. Um, I can even think of, there, I was watching a video on um, the history of rap uh, last night. And um, one of the producers at Death Row was talking about when they acquired Eminem, right? And at first everyone's skeptical, like, oh, what's this white kid know about gangster rap? Mm-hmm. And then it's like, oh, but he has his own perspective of growing up in, in the lower lower class white neighborhood in Detroit. Right. And that's its own perspective. And it brings this own unique flavor to it. And it's not it's not lesser for that. And so I, I appreciate how a lot of your work kind of addresses those kind of things. Thanks. I appreciate it. Here's a Victor Laval quote. Um, Victor Laval, I'm sorry. Quote. Um, that horrific realization that all Lovecraft's characters undergo that the universe doesn't revolve around them, that's not a problem any Black character would ever have. If you're Black, you don't think the universe as a whole thinks you're wonderful because all you have to do, if you're a Black American, all you have to do is walk through America and this country teaches you. The idea that you would be driven mad because you found out that the universe doesn't think you're special is a joke to me as a black American. I thought that was so wonderfully put, you know, because a lot of Lovecraft's characters do go nuts when they realize that, oh my God, the earth wasn't created for me, you know? It is, I mean, for Lovecraft, that is the most horrifying, right? potentially the most horrifying reality. But of course, like even for Lovecraft, I do have to um, find myself I do find the part of myself uh, like, uh, I don't know if I'd call it empathy, but knowing that it, like it's very different to me that Lovecraft is from, at that point, an almost essentially penniless family living, he will eventually marry and live off his wife's income. Mm -hmm. Um, His father died of syphilis in an institution. His mother died in an institution. And to know that like, um, like to my mind, there's something, there's a version of this where you're, you're the, the, the son of an astoundingly wealthy family writing those stories from your palace of wealth. And then there's a version where you realize you're two generations removed from when this gig was a good gig. And all you have is the table scraps and part of the reason you cling to the past so much and part of the reason you fear and loathe all these new immigrants showing up is because you know you missed the train for when this was a good ride to be a Lovecraft, you know? And so it doesn't absolve him for me as a reader, but it's a different, it's, it's for me, it's, a, it's like the sort of the, the pain and the venom and the sadness is like a is a different sort of charge because I know what Lovecraft's life was as he's writing these stories, knowing that he knows that 
not more than a couple dozen people are going to read these stories, knowing that he has this astoundingly high opinion of himself and the world does not. All those things together, they just, for me, they paint a portrait that is in some ways like, um, you know, uh, closer to like, uh, I mean, this is a little bit flippant, but closer to like what I imagine the average incel is thinking like, right? Uh, I missed the boat. And rather than, as we were talking about earlier, rather than saying I have to change to another boat, they say, as this boat sinks, I'm going to take everyone swimming by down with me because I just don't see any other choice. And like, that's a very particular, that's its own perspective too, do you know? And, uh, and uh, just feeling like that, it's always, for my mind, if I can, I always try to say like, okay, that's in there too. It doesn't make me in any way forgive anything, but I understand it different. You know, I understand where he is, where he's coming from it, when he's doing these things and understand what, in a weird way, like a, it also makes it less powerful to me, right? Because even as I'm reading, I'm like, you couldn't do anything. That power passed you by. And that's the whole point is the power is something else. And you're driven mad in the stories because the power is now with someone else. As something else, the great gods. And that is a terrifying thought for any human beings. Not just a white guy from Rhode Island. Any human being wants to think they have some power over their lives. And when they don't, if you're lucky, they protest and try to get that power through means, like say in this country, the civil rights movement, let's say, um, uh, gay rights movement, trans rights movements, everything, like through the systems that exist, I would like to get the same power as anyone else. I, then, you know. I, I heard a quote once, I don't remember where, a fic, in, in a fiction book, TV show somewhere, where the guy says, um, control, that's all we really want, isn't it? Control over our own lives. And I thought about that. I thought, is that too simplistic? Maybe, but it, is, it covers a lot, doesn't it? It covers, I mean, just having the control to be able to, I don't know, like uh, my wife uh, like has a little space to grow some flowers, some right. plants rather, and some vegetables. And when she gets to go out there and do that, she always comes back. It's like a reset. I just got to put my hands in the dirt. I grew a few tomatoes on the side of the uh, building. It's not a big thing. You're not feeding anybody but it's just a little something our, our older son plops in his mouth. Yeah. But, it, but it does give a sense of like, I've done something. I have control over that thing. I wanna let you get back to your family, but last but not least, Victor, um, first of all, thanks for doing this, man. It's been so great talking with you. Oh, it's been a pleasure. It's been really a pleasure. Um, it, 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 just, I'll just put it bluntly. I know that there's a lot of writers out there that listen to this show or what and or watch this show and i know that they look up to you they look up to other writers as well um what advice how about if i put it this way um what advice would you what would you have liked to have known when you started writing if you could give your younger self advice and say this is what you really need to know, or this is what you really need to consider. What what would what might you say, or what might you advise anyone starting out? Well, I will tell I'll, I'll tell a little story about this, which is uh, so my first book uh, was a book of short stories. It came out long ago, nineteen ninety nine, and uh, the book came out um, on a press called Vintage Books. It was a, a Random House sort of imprint. Uh, got paid a little bit of money. It came out. It was reviewed in some nice places. And uh, I got to do readings. I got to go a few different places in the country to do it. And I didn't enjoy any of it. And the reason I didn't enjoy any of it is because I didn't understand this at the time. But subconsciously, semi-subconsciously, I thought that when I published that book, it would fix everything. 
that was unhappy about me. I thought it would, it would, if I'm being really honest, my daydream was number one, that like when we sent it out, I was going to get five offers. They were going to have a bidding war and I was going to get a million dollars for the book. That did not happen. Um, the next thing I thought was the book would come out. My father would call me up. He lived in Syracuse, New York. My mom and him split up when I was one and we didn't have much of a relationship at all. But he would call me up the day that book came out because he would, of course, buy it on the day it came out and read it. And he would apologize to me for abandoning me. And he would tell me he had picked the wrong family because my, he remarried and had a son, my uh, brother. He would tell me he had been in the wrong. He had done everything wrong. He loved me most. I was the best son he could have ever had. And, um, and of course, then I would reject him because the, that's the other part of the dream is right. Like you figured out that you were wrong and you apologize. And then I go, screw you. And I walk away. Right. And of I, course, I'm, I'm so sorry about you. No, 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 I appreciate that. But, yeah, but I, I don't want to interrupt your train of thought, but I just wanted to say that. I appreciate that very much. Um, but I share it to say that like, what I wish I had known when I was younger or newer was that no book was ever going to solve that hurt. No three books, no TV deal, none of those things was going to fix the things that I needed to work on in therapy, with my family, for myself. And because I demanded subconsciously, like I didn't know that this is what I was doing, but with time and distance, I see the reason I was so unhappy when I published my first book was because I wasn't letting my book just be the amazing thing that somebody somewhere wanted to buy this bunch of paper, put it out in bookstores, and that some people read it is a miracle of life. Right. And they paid me a little money, not a lot, but they paid me a little money. I could pay a little rent for a little while with it. That's amazing. And yet it took me like, I would say even like another book or two before I, I had enough distance to say, you gotta let a book do what a book can do. And then you gotta let work in on your own self and on your psyche and on your heart and on your wounded little child you got to do that work separate from the book. And ever since I came to that understanding and then did go into therapy and did work with someone who was very good on just talking through the, the hurt of that child and dealing with just like, you never just, you'll never fix those hurts, but you can talk about those hurts. Those hurts are just part of the, just part of how it went. Um, ever since doing that work, uh, and continuing to try to work on that work, I have been able to enjoy every single good thing that happened. And when they go well, I've been able to really celebrate that. And when things don't work out that well, maybe it means I wrote a book that somebody, that people just didn't really connect with. Maybe it means that the world has to catch up with it. Maybe it was just bad timing, but it doesn't mean I am a unlovable, unloved thing. Right, it doesn't. It has nothing to do with my personal value, um, and so that's what I wish I could tell myself as a younger writer, or tell anyone who's writing. I mean, whatever stage they need to hear it, but particularly newer writers, like just don't put so much pressure on that book or on that first story or whatever it is, because then you just won't get to just celebrate it, you know. And the point of all this is just to celebrate these things. It's the journey and it's not a, I'll be happy when this, when X happens. That's right. I'll be it's, happy when Y happens. Yes. I mean, I feel like it's, I'll be happy for a few minutes and then I can go back to self-loathing, but at least for a few minutes, <laughs> I can enjoy that. You know what I mean? And that's okay. It's a good thing. I, I read a long time ago before it was even easy to self-publish a book, um, a lady wrote a book, um, I'm blanking on the title, but it was, uh, oh, The Lost Soul Companion. Very good little little book. Uh, anybody like you, me, um, 
Bridget, Ben, probably anybody watching, just, you know, creative dreamer types. And it, it didn't get a lot of attention. But This Is For The Internet was really widely used, too. And, and she said, I got, I got seven letters from people thanking me, telling me how much this book meant to them. Seven letters. That's more than a lot of people get. You know, she was changing her expectations to, okay, I didn't make a million dollars in this book, but really was that the goal or was it to, if I help just one person, then this book is a success. Sure. And especially to go back to another Simpsons quote, when they had that Lisa's doll, especially if that person pays $42,000 for the book. Anyway, I'm just, I had to bring home a joke. I had to do it. I apologize. Well, you know, everything, But, everything either comes back to, to the Simpsons or, or, or Batman, Wonder Woman or Superman. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, that's, that's right. So um trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to ask, but I, I, I think that might be it. Let me just double check, make sure my my fibro fog is not um I, I will say this. This is the first time I've got an old friend, his name I won't reveal his entire name, but uh I, I call him JR. I grew up with him. He was a few years older than me. I really looked up to him growing up and he's watching live and uh because you are so brilliant he just tipped me 10 bucks so i love how this works out <laughs> um anyway jr says i love this interview wow i have not read any of laval's works but we'll be buying some in the near future great interview uh, thank you JR. a lot of nice comments which you can look at if you go back and look at this later victor it, it usually takes a uh, three or four hours for the comments to show up on the on the archive version okay and to be clear for those of you that want to do what jr is doing going in back and reading uh victor's work on amazon a bunch of it's on sale on kindle so ballad of black yes. Tom, for example is four um, dollars yeah. it's worth way the more Devil than and that, silver so. like 4.99 or 5.99 something like that yeah and these are like ballad of black tom is easily my favorite cosmic horror novel ever And I'll, it's it's not just me that has a very high opinion of it. Uh, go check it out. I, I promise uh, everyone listening, it, it's it's worth your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate it. So anyway, yes. Um, Victor, is there anything that you wanted to touch on before that I may have missed that you wanted to wanted to say? No, this has been uh, wonderful, and uh, I feel I just feel uh, uh, grateful to get the easing treatment. <laughs> uh, to get to hang out and talk and uh, well, uh, be a part of it. We, we finally put our, our schedules together. Both both you and I had to reschedule for various reasons. And yes. so I'm, I'm glad we finally got together. Matthew Carpenter is going to yell at me because I did it. It, it happened on the uh, HP Lovecraft Film Festival, but he's been mad at me before. So, um, so yeah, he's not really mad, but uh, he, he thinks a lot of your work as well. So I appreciate that. And, uh, Rick wanted to be here. And um, yeah, I would say anyone listening who has not checked out Victor's work yet, or maybe has just read one of his, his, his books. Uh, yeah, work your way through it. Um, I just finished The Changeling and what a brilliant book. And Thank you. Uh, my next my next one is uh, I've read The Ballad of, Va Ballad of Black Tom, of course. A while back, my, my next one's going to be uh, The Devil in Silver. So thank um, you. So, yeah, thanks for being on, Victor. Um, and thanks for being a Patreon. Yeah. Uh, thanks for letting me use your name and, and tell everybody, uh, hey, be like be like Victor, be a Patreon. It's my yeah, pleasure uh, for I, sure. Yeah, I love your bar analogy. Okay, so, good. <laughs> so, so anyway. And uh, Bridget, Ben, Mike, it was so good to see you all and hang out so bridget ah anything else that you want I, you know you were very quiet today you're usually not this man quiet. don't put me on the spot <laughs> right, if, if you don't have anything to say that's fine you you look happy so like um, most people listening just uh soaking up the wisdom <laughs> well well thank you oh you mean victor 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It feels like I got to sit in on a college class. Honestly, this was great. <laughs> yes. It's like I got a free lecture out of this. <laughs> oh, <you know>? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you, I do you know what I wanted to ask before we left. Um, what do you have coming up as far as, um, I, I know you've got some TV adaptations coming up. Is that right? Yeah, I guess the most uh, pressing thing would be uh, The Changeling is going to be a series on Apple TV. Oh, sweet. Uh, yeah. And, uh, gonna, uh, well, I guess they'll start shooting in, the original plan was December, but uh, the woman who's the showrunner lives in New Orleans, so I think they might have got bumped back a little bit. Um, but uh, should be starting, I think, either late fall or early spring. Uh, I don't know if they'll shoot in New York or if they'll shoot in someplace that looks like New York. I guess it'll depend on uh, what uh, Apple decides. Um, but it's coming, and uh, it stars a, um, a wonderful the good, actor the good named thing Keith is, is that It used to be so hard to watch something on apple if you weren't an apple computer person but now yes the roku has added a um a uh apple app or whatever to their i think they're getting better about it because i mean especially like the success of like ted lasso uh i think they i think they want to let people find their shows yeah you know so uh, it'll be when it comes out it'll be a lot easier to watch than it would have been in the past that's any, right anything else coming out after that i know there's things in the works but uh there's th- i mean probably the only other thing is uh i it got announced like not that long ago i'm writing an x-man comic there's a a, a villain called a uh, saber uh and so i'm writing a a, a couple mini series about him uh, and he's one of my favorite characters from that universe even though he's one of the bad guys um so that's i think january will be the first issue Okay, awesome. So, I'll look for that. I'm gonna I'm gonna pick up Eve on Comicsology, and I'll and I'm gonna read the, the Devil and Silver next. So I sure appreciate all of it, yeah. and I appreciate all, all right. of you your time. Yeah, thank you for being here, and um, thanks everybody for watching. Special thanks to all my patrons, and and we'll see everybody next week. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming out. Yeah, who's watching? Have a great night. <laughs> all right, good night.